talks about the time that we're given. There's plenty of songs out there as I was trying to pick a walk-up song today that talk about live like you were dying. There's no day. I mean, today's the day. We have all these songs we sang. Come now. Now is the time to worship. Today is the day. Yes, this is the day. And as we get ready for 2024, we're still in the 23 we prep, 24 we rep, right? Um, it was funny after last week's sermon, how many people were coming up with their own rhymes. Uh, I saw Jennifer on Tuesday night and I was like, yeah, 24 do more. She said, I like 24, shut the door, 24, we ain't doing no more. I, some other people came up with rhymes I'm not even going to tell you about. But we, we think about the things that we have to do and it all comes in a timely manner. There are a few of you, my brother, which makes me feel bad all the time. He is completely retired. He does not know how much I envy the fact that he is, he'll say we're only two years apart, but he's completely retired. I'm not even looking at retirement in two years or two years after his retirement. He is fully retired. How many of you are retired? Raise your hand. Yeah, that kind of makes us upset because you're, you know, your time is a little bit different. I get up in the morning and I've already thought of what I have to do and how my time's going to go and, and at this point and at this and we got to get off at 3.30 and then i got to be here by 5.30 picking up Coach Billy and, and, and trying to plan all those things out as teachers and you got the bells ringing and I don't, kids always come to me, when, when's the next bell? I don't know. I don't have time to figure out when the next bell is. They change, right, Ms. Edison? They change every week and you're like, is that bell for this? And in time just keeps going on, right? Pink Floyd sings about time. Alan Parsons Project sings time. He's flowing like a river. Time is something that we only have a little bit of. Unfortunately, in church, we, we've been taught this eternity thing, and it is real. For God's love, the world gave his son, and then we have an eternal uh, relationship with him. Some people think eternity begins when you die. It doesn't. It begins the moment that you're born, because eternity will be one way or another. Eternity living is in Christ. Eternity, you can still be eternal, but you're not going to be where you want to be. So we have this life that we live, and we have all of this time that we think about as eternity, but we have a very short bit of time on this earth. I can tell you as your pastor, one of the things that kind of, kind of, it, it really sit down and I, and really want to kind of go to a pity party. How many have pity parties? I do sometimes. <coughs> My wife is so wonderful because she just sits there when I have one, and, and they don't last very long. That's a good thing. Uh, yes, yesterday I kind of had a moment where I'm sitting there, and my mom had her estate sale at her house this weekend on Friday and Saturday, and my brother, with his words of wisdom, I appreciate him. He he went over on Friday and he said, "If you can, if anything," I said, "I have a kind of this. I I, I just kind of want to see." And he said, "If you can get past that, do not go." I said, well, okay. Didn't take his wisdom. Should have taken it, brother. But I went over on Saturday, and it was funny because we go through the house, and they had it well organized and stuff set up, and priced, everything was priced out, and people were shopping, and that's okay. I say these words, and Mom, if you hear them, I know you don't want to hear what's going on here, but Jesus does, so if you want to tell her, I think Mom would very, be very excited that she had an estate sale at her house. <laughs> We didn't have a yard sale or a rummage sale like in back days, but she had an estate sale. The funny thing was that we went through there, we're looking around at stuff. We bought stuff. <laughs> it's my stuff. <laughs> Rachel was like, you're crazy. But I was like, we were like, we didn't. Oh, there's that thing. Yeah, I won't buy it. The guy who cut us a deal, I'm like, a deal? It's my stuff. I was thinking to myself, but we went in the back room and there was my scrapbook. And it has pictures of me and oh, things I got, awards I got in elementary school. And, and it had my picture when I was like two weeks old. And, and so we walk up there. They didn't price that. I was like, it's priceless. It's my scrapbook. But we walked up with it and had a little bank that had Kaylin's name on it. We grabbed that too. But we go to check out and I, I lay the scrapbook down and I said, the scrapbook wasn't priced. And he goes, oh, you can kind of have that. I say, yeah, that's my picture. And he goes, your picture's in the scrapbook at the state sale? I'm like, yes, sir, this is my house. He goes, what? I said, I'm Randy Humphrey. This is my mom's house, and that's my scrapbook. And he's like, I'll cut you a deal. And I'm still thinking, <laughs> <laughs> you know, 
Listen, if I would have known a year, and I say this, this I, I just had that emotional come over, that's mom's stuff, and, and I thought about it. If I would have known God's timing for life, we say that we would have done things differently. <laughs> the song, the great country song, Live Like You Were Dying, I'm going to ride a bull named Fu Manchu or whatever for eight seconds. Think about how short a time that is. I'm going to go skydiving. Skydiving doesn't last very long. And if your chute doesn't open, it goes real quick. <laughs> I think about all these things that we say and we think about the time that we have. Do you realize that you really do focus on time past or it's gone? You can't get it back. You can't go, well, you want to. No, you don't get it back. The only time that we have anything to do with is the time we have before us. And so therefore, as I encouraged you last week, and we came up with the, uh, the theme, the time for the task, uh, Acts 2024, 20, we have to be timely in what we're doing. I didn't know the slide was going to have that little clock being going the whole time, so I get fully distracted. My, I'm like, okay, go around one more time. <laughs> time for the task. This today is going to be in Colossians 4. Because God speaks really pointed about time. I've heard people misuse scripture about time. Well, a day is like a thousand years. That's in God's time, not in ours. We don't have... I say this all the time in my Wednesday group because they're really straightforward and honest with me, obviously. And we say, how many of you would like to live in this condition for a thousand years? <laughs> Heck no. no. Coach Billy, you only got 982 more years to coach basketball. <laughs> He's like, I'm quitting now. I'm going to drive off a cliff or something. We, we can't imagine. Social Security is not going to last until you're 65. A thousand years, we couldn't live. We couldn't sustain life that way. Our time is very short on this earth, meaning we have a lot to do in a little bit of time. My only, and I started by saying the only thing that I ever give myself a pity party about is the fact that I wasted a lot of time. I wasted a lot of time knowing God, supposedly getting baptized. Knowing this guy named Jesus Christ, I knew what Christmas meant, I knew what Easter meant, I knew all of that stuff. I had, I had a Bible since I was a tiny kid. I was christened by my grandfather, which means in the Methodist church when I was christened that my family would bring me up in a church manner. They would bring me up, and they did. Did I, was I sold out? No. Did I waste time? A ton. I don't regret my college days. I loved my college days, but I wasted a whole lot of time in college. You can look at my grades and I wasted a lot of time in college. My time was my time and I'm going to do whatever. Were you supposed to go to class? I got other things I want to do. Then I went off to the military and I could have been all over the world spreading the love of Jesus Christ. I flew everywhere. I didn't. I wasted time. We don't need to be about wasting time. The next slide is the task for the 2024, if you were not with us last week. It's a choral response. Yay, we have choral church on high church today. So the pastor part is my part. The family part is all of our part. So let's try this. The pastor says the task, Acts 2024, the task. Y'all didn't that. Didn't worry that. We that. There we go. The task this year is Acts 2024. The task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. That is your task, as well as my task. The truth of it is, it's the biblical task for all of God's people. It's kind of sad in a way that it is what God has commanded us to do and called us to do and created us to do. But I need to remind you of that, and I need to remind myself of that. The task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. Um... Colossians, here's the scripture for today. Colossians chapter 4, but the scripture for the covering scripture today is verse 5. Walk in wisdom toward outsiders, making the most of the time. Church of Colossae. Paul was writing to one of his, this is an epistle in Colossians. It's the epistle or the letter that Paul wrote to the church of Colossae. And let me tell you what he was doing as he's writing. He's in prison. 
Now, some of you will say, well, it's really kind of house arrest if you've read scripture. But he's in prison. He's in prison. The Romans have him, and they, they you can't do this. And, and they, for all good purposes, they can shut down his ministry. It's done. Paul retired of you because you were a missionary. You were going all over the known world, which is the Roman empowered world. And he's traveling by ship, and he's traveling here, and he's doing events. He, he's changing lives everywhere he goes. And the government tried to stop him. Let's think about 2023 and 2024 now. God's people still called by his name to go and share, and yet the government intervenes. It's doing that. You do realize that if you believe in the way that I believe as your pastor, you're called an evangelical Christian. Amen. You may not have ever heard that term, and I love that somebody said, amen, you're evangelical. You evangelize. You go and share the good news. That's what evangelism is. And therefore, you are an evangelical Christian. And here's the crazy thing. In the political world, you're labeled. You're an evangelical. That is not a good term for you. They're not looking at them like, oh, we're so glad we have so many evangelicals that they're going to change the world with the love of Christ. No, they're looking at you like this. They're the evangelicals. We know the way they're going to vote. We know what they believe. And they're not going to change. And they don't agree with And you're holding everybody back. Walk in wisdom towards outsiders. The church at Colossae needed to reach those outside, making the most of the time that you have. This is the time, next slide, that God has given us. We sing songs like that. This is the day. We just sang one. But do we really, really, really understand that this is the time God has given us? I think we would, if we understood it like he says it, that we would live in a little bit different. Think about this. Your boss at work. They walk up to you. You're in the middle of it. You're exhausted. You've been testing for a week. You're tired of this. You're tired of that. And out of the blue, they walk up and they say, take the next two days off. They gave you time off. You almost lose it right there. You're like, what? Oh my gosh, you've given me time. When we lose someone, they say, you have time with the family. They give you time. Let's, let's go to this concert. They give you time. You have free tickets to go to a concert. Let me, I got time to go to a concert. When I sit down to eat, I've got time to eat. They, there are all these things that the world is trying to give us, and God gave us all the time we have just to live. He gave us this time that we have right now. One of the things I've always not spoken a ton about it's stewardship. As soon as I say the word, every Baptist person went, oh, here we go. We're going to go tithe an offering. No. <laughs> stewardship is taking good care of what God has given you. So therefore, if God gave me time, I'm supposed to take good care of it. Job was a great example of taking good care of time. Everybody tried to distract him from following that, following and trusting in God. This is the time God has given us. The Bible is clear. Walking wisdom towards outsider, making the most of the time. Verse 2, you've got to read some stuff before you get to 5. Verse 2 says this Devote yourselves to prayer. Stay alert in it with thanksgiving. That's good. Before I can get to a point where I am going to go and reach outsiders, before I'm going to walk and understand the time that I have, I've got to start. And it gives you simple guidelines. I need a devotional. I need somebody to outline my time. What's the five-year mission for the church? Have you outlined? I don't know. I need to know that this church needs to devote ourselves to prayer. And while we're praying, stay alert in it with thanksgiving. That means don't just sit around and ask. Today was what? Amen. God, God does examples. I can't make this stuff up. It's true. I did not call everybody before and say, listen, I know the three of you that are going to come up to the prayer chairs first. I need all of you to give a prayer report. I didn't say that. But everybody prays God in the midst of asking of God. If we're going to devote ourselves to prayer and understand his authority over all things, being sovereign, we need to stay alert in it with thanksgiving. That means I need to be alert. Did that person get healed? Did they not? But they still trust in Jesus. You will hear me say something, and I hope you understand it. I'm not, I'm not, not listening to you. I thank all of you. Prayer chairs is not easy for Pastor Andy. I have to think about what everybody's saying, and I, and I try to do really well at it. I, I love uh, Mr. Shiver. Greg always says, I oh, can't do what you do, but I, I try to do them. 
In all of those things, we need to be alert to the fact that I don't always pray for somebody's physical healing. I got somebody. I need you to understand this from your pastor. Your spiritual healing is always greater than your physical healing. How do I understand that? I can take that really theological and go all the way back to a child with non-accountability when he doesn't understand right and wrong. They actually get to kind of go to heaven because they don't understand that. So therefore, what is more important that they physically died at a young age or that they got the grace of God? The grace of God is much greater than the fact that they go at such an early age. Meaning the spiritual healing is far more important than your physical healing. Nine times out of ten, physical healing is for our selfishness, and I'm okay with that. Heal my mom, Lord, I cried out. Do not let her die. But in the midst of that, I had to be alert in Thanksgiving that even though she may not make it out of the hospital, she's going to have an eternal life with Jesus Christ. Amen. And she does. Yes. Right now. She didn't worry about the estate sale and what sold and what didn't sell. She is in heaven walking with Jesus Christ. That's something we should all desire. Devote yourselves to prayer. Stay alert in the Thanksgiving. Be aware of the power of prayer and the need for praise. Do not ever feel like you're doing nothing by saying, I will pray for you, unless you're not praying for them. Do not use in church ease, I'll pray for you as a way to get rid of someone. We've done that a lot around churches. Somebody comes up, uh, they're gonna talk, uh, I'll pray for you. And you walk away. You better be about praying for them. There's power in prayer. You're calling on the name of the Almighty. I love the illustration of Tony Evans. Obviously, he does great illustrations. And he talked about blasphemy. And he talked about how you use God's name in vain. And he talked about using Jesus' name in vain. Jesus is sitting at the right hand of the Father. And he sits in, in, as your lawyer, basically. God the Father says, what about, oh, he believes in us, Dad. He accepted me. He sits right there. He's a great comforter. He's a great counselor. But if you, in the midst of whatever you're dealing with, having no desire to actually trust in him, but you call upon his name, he stands up, and Tony Evans does a real good thing where he stands up and he's like, who called me? And you're doing it over and over. If you have a lawyer, you continually call him for things that are not necessary, they're going to get tired of it, and they're not going to give you counsel anymore. Beware of the power of prayer. It is absolutely the greatest power and authority we have to lift people up to Jesus. Yes. To intercede on their behalf. Clarify, clarify some theology. I can't pray you into heaven. I can't. But I can pray for you to get in the right place, in the right situation, where you'll receive Jesus Christ so that you on your own can get into heaven. Yes. I can't pray you. Some people will teach it. I can't pray you into heaven. And there's an absolute need for praise. Not because God needs to be told that he's done something really good. He's God. God is good? All the time. All the time. God is good. So we don't need to tell him that. He's okay. You need to recognize that. When you recognize his authority and his value, you will cherish him more. In a relationship, I've been good on relationships, having a day with been good on some relation stuff. stuff. If, in a relationship, if you do not praise the other person and see their worth, you will never cherish them and love them the way they should be loved. You will take them for granted. You will misuse them. You will abuse them because you don't think they have worth. Pastor, that's good. You have to understand and you need to praise. It only said that in verse 2. Verse 3 follows that up about prayer, and it says this, at the same time, pray also for us that God may open the door to us for the message to speak the mystery of the Messiah for which I am in prison. Pray for me so that I can get the word out while I'm in prison. Many of you will tell me, I can't, <coughs> Pastor, I don't, I don't have the right words to say. Well, then pray for the right words to say. Pastor, I get nervous when somebody even just asks me a question about going to heaven. Well, then pray. He says this. Pray for him. Pray for them. Pray for us. Pray for the church. 
Pray sometimes that you're not asking for healing. You're not asking for provision. You're not asking for wisdom. You're praying for an opportunity to share the mystery of the Messiah. If God, through the writer Paul, declares it a mystery, it's a mystery. This is not Nancy Drew. You do not have to solve the mystery. You just have to recognize that in that mystery, pray for opportunities to testify. That means to represent or present the good news or the gospel. Pray for opportunities to testify, represent or present the good news of the gospel. I was having a talk with somebody on Friday and we were talking about this, this testifying thing. Everyone in this room has a testimony. We are going to go over what the what they talk about writing your testimony and understanding your testimony. We'll go through that this year. But you all have a testimony. You're testifying to something. We wore Buccaneer gear today. You're testifying to one or two things. If nobody talks to you today and you come up to them and say, hey, our church had a thing because DJ Peters absolutely loves the Bucks and he asked, could pastor, could we do a Bucks day? I said, absolutely for DJ, we'll do a Bucks day. So people are going to see you and say, hey, you must be a Buccaneer fan. You're testifying by what you wear that you're a fan of the Bucks. That's why some people don't wear it, right? That's fine. I have a grunt shirt on. They're like, somebody, somebody will say, oh, you must really love the Bucks. Somebody who really loves the Bucks goes, the guy don't even play there anymore. You have a Kelsey shirt on, as well. I was told earlier. All right, Travis Kelsey. Here's the deal. What you wear, the way you walk, and the way you talk testifies about the things that people think you believe. You don't have time. Here's what you don't have time to do. Explain it to everyone else. I'm not against, this is great, great. Melanie, thank you. I'm not against tattoos. I'm not going to stand up one day and go, you can't have a tattoo. I'm not going to say that. I've always wanted a tattoo. I probably shouldn't say that. Probably I've always desired to have a tattoo on my arm. And I drew it out. And it's two alligators. They're black and green. And they're, they're fighting each other. And they're biting their tails. And it's an armband. And I would look like one of them Samoan guys with a big muscle with an armband. And then all of a sudden I looked at my arms one day. And I'm like, that'd be a flabby looking dead gator on there. And I can be honest with y'all and tell you the thing that holds me back from tattoos is the price. <laughs> As soon as they say it, they're like, oh, this would be cool. And I went to a place one time, and they're like, that'll be 200. What? No. I'm not spending that. That's somebody drawing me. No. I, you do what you want to do. That's not what I'm saying, but somebody will say that. You know how many people in church have told me about, hey, they're all tatted up. They must be evil. No. Hats. I am your pastor, and I'm standing in the pulpit today, or on this stage, with a hat on. Blasphemy. Ah! Uh, yet it says that in heaven they'll all have crowns on their heads, and they'll stand before the Father. So I think it's okay to have a hat on. <coughs> the Catholic, the bishop, he gets a cool hat, a, a, a best hat. You've always wanted one of those. I do, but you don't want to have one hat <laughs> Buying them for myself would be wrong. I think. So, everybody, see, good example. If I wore that hat to you, thinking I'm being righteous, and I really do feel like it's a, a sign that I'm following God, somebody would say, he's making fun of it. I'm not. I was at our church in Georgia, and I remember when somebody, an older deacon or elder, got upset because a kid walked in with a hat. And he walked up and snatched it off his head. That kid never came back to church. We don't know where that kid is, but all he thinks is that somebody at church will, is, is ripping my hat. They don't know why he wears a hat. Maybe he's ashamed. Maybe he's being more biblical than you and he's wearing a head covering. Think about it for a minute. We are all testifying to something. By you showing up at church, you're testifying that there's you have value. I value my time at going to church. I appreciate that. We're going to talk a bit about the second mile, which we talked about on Wednesday night, but that's going to be a sermon coming up in the future. That's just a simple, this, people will testify about where, where you go to eat. Right? My wife, I tell you, I love my wife to death. Pastor Kimberly, is, is she, she can teach some Bible, she can 
spread some wisdom and everything. But last Friday night, I'm just going to testify to you for a minute, baby. Be honest. She wanted a Cuban sandwich on a Friday night. Cuban sandwiches places are closed. The only fine, the only place we could find was 1916 Pub. They had a Cuban sandwich, and we went and sat there. I prayed for everybody in that place. I didn't want to go. <laughs> the waitress was one of my youth, one of my students back in town. I prayed for them. <laughs> and guess what? She didn't even get a Cuban. Now I don't know what we went there for. <laughs> you and the things that you do or don't do testify. A powerful lesson that I learned is that just by not going along with the rest of them, you testify something very bold. When I was in the military and I was the flight operations officer, and every one of those pilots has a very, very colorful language, <coughs> and yet I would take their what they thought was an intelligent conversation and use words like poop or doo-doo. And they'd be like, why are you going back to when you're three? Because me not choosing to speak like you makes me different than you. I'm set apart. I'm set aside. I, I, I transform by the renewing of my mind. I'm different. Pray for opportunities to testify, represent, or present the good news. Colossians 4, before we get to our 5, which is where we started. So that I may reveal it as I am required to speak. So that I may reveal it, going back to which I am in prison, the mystery of the Messiah, the message to speak, the good God opened the door for the message, so that I may reveal it as I am required to speak. What you say should reveal to whom you pray. What you say should reveal to whom you pray. People should know that. I have a teacher at school that always says, thank you for being an example of what a real Christian should be. I can tell you that teacher doesn't agree with my theology at all. Not one bit. But they're thankful that I represent Christianity in a positive manner. What you say should reveal to whom you pray. I shouldn't have to wear a church... A shirt that says I'm sold out I, I confess with my mouth I believe in heart I'm, I'm, I'm sanctified I'm justified I should just be the way that I you all have a testimony in the way you say and the way you carry yourself should be the way you reveal to whom you pray I put one last slide this is the time for the task I don't know and I'm not going to stand before you because I'm not uh, privy to that information, I have not asked God, is this the year that all comes to all? I haven't asked him that. I don't look at blood moons. I don't look at what rises in the east or in the west or who's called a bear or who's not. I, I, I've read Revelation many times. Um, there's only one Revelation, remember, it's singular. I've read Daniel. I understand that. I understand uh, being called up. I, I, I know all those things. But I don't know that it's this year. Just as much as I don't know that it's this afternoon. Just as much as I don't know it's before we leave this building. I don't know those things. The things I do know is God gave His Son for everyone. It says, for God so loved the whole world. I do know that He's called us to be His representatives here on this earth. I know that. The Word of God speaks to that. The Word of God speaks to the things that we need to know for our daily existence. If He wanted us to know when the time was come, things would, that would have been put in here. George had that question for me yesterday. We had a little discussion. Kimberly said it was a little loud. It was just a discussion. <laughs> but he said that if he knew, because we we're talking about bills and who pays for them after you pass, and responsibilities. He said, so you're telling me that if he knew he was going to die, and, and no one would have to pay for his bills, that he would just go out and charge and charge and charge and get crazy. Yes, George, that is the truth. I'm not responsible. I'm not his child. I'm his parent. But they could legally not hold me responsible. So yes, you could do that. Many times people say that, like the song says, well, if I knew I was going to die, I'd go out and do those things I've always wanted. What I'm asking is, I want in that list of things you would do, 
when you think you might be dying is sharing Jesus. Because you all are dying. I didn't expect 2023 to go the way it went. I have no idea and I'm just holding on to what's going to happen in 2024. I believe there are going to be great things, God things, because he's constantly moving, he's constantly undoing. As we see time and opportunity for his son to return, that just gives us more opportunities as believers in Jesus Christ. I don't know who's going to be with us at the end of this year. Don't know that. You can look back over a year. You can look back over a couple years and say, I did not know that person would not be with us this day. And as much as that breaks our heart, it gives us a challenge for the task. It's time is now. We may hear that. We may, I need you to buy into that. Now is the time that we have. This is it. If we make it next year, I have another challenge for 2025. God willing, praise report, we get to move on to next year. But if we don't, can we be like Paul in the midst of our own prison and all the things the world is trying to do to hold us down and pin us down? Can we still be about his business? I will pray for your health. I'll pray for your, your, where you live. I'll pray for your job. I'll pray for wisdom. I'll pray for strength. I'll pray for all those things, but I hope you'll pray that you get the opportunity to share Jesus. That's the task we have at the end. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, give us those opportunities. Many of us might be thinking right now, well, I'm not ready. I need to get... No, we don't. You're ready. The reason why the information was never shared to Jesus is shared to, to, to mankind is because we don't need to know that. All we need to know is God's good all the time and that He's ready and willing to receive all of us. <coughs> right now. This day, Pastor Kimberly said a beautiful last week after the task after, that we need to be about accepting Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Lord, I pray if people are standing on that, on that or sitting on the fence, there is no such thing as with, with God. You're either with or without. For those of us that know you and trust you and are called children of God, I pray you give us that encouragement, that strength, that unction. But I pray mostly that in our free will, in our free choice, we choose to share you. Yeah. And for our brothers and sisters that don't fully know you yet, I pray that they choose to know more. To trust more. To believe more. Lord God, thank you for you being you. In Jesus' name.